Welcome to Book Lovers Corner for August, a belated one because we've been in lockdown. Um, we have not had the normal monthly meeting. This is it, two weeks later, and we'll have September's uh, next 20th. in two weeks' time on the 28th of September. So a um, bit of confusion here, but um, we're getting there. So welcome to Book Lovers Corner, and um, we're broadcast from the Wairarapa Community Access Radio Station, Arrow FM 92.7, and we are broadcast every uh, fourth Tuesday of the month, 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. throughout the year. This is one of 12 Community Access Radio Stations, and around, throughout New Zealand and we're sponsored by Elmo's Books which is our wonderful independent bookshop in Carterton and on, us, uh, on our panel here as we do every month is Steve Hello Velda owner of Elmo's so thank you Steve, welcome and we have also today as usual Gareth Rapson and so the team of three of us are um, representing Book Lovers Corner this year. So welcome, Gareth. We are available, as I said, on um, Arrow FM 92.7, which you can also download as a podcast, but you can also listen or, or, or watch on TV, Wairapa TV Freeview Channel 41 and also on YouTube. So there are a variety of ways of accessing this program. And if you've got any feedback, we'd appreciate uh, you getting in touch with uh, the Arrow FM's Facebook page uh, to make your comments. Each time too, we have a, uh, what we call Notes from a Far Isle from Sue Lawrence, uh, Steve's sister, who used to work in Arrow FMs, but who's gone up to the Waiheke Island to family and wine and, unfortunately, at the moment, lockdown, yeah. which I'm sure she's just getting plenty of reading done. I hope she got a pile of books out from the library before she um, went into lockdown. Now, today we're going to hear from the three of us, uh, but Steve is starting off, and I think Steve, before you talk about the books that you're going to do today, you want to comment on the wonderful Wairapa uh, Poetry Day we had from a broadcast from Arrow FM uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, well, <coughs> if I can just talk about Wairapa Word mm. for the moment. Uh, we've been pretty busy lately, um, so back at the beginning of August, we had a, a book launch for Good For You, Helen Dew, which is a, a children's book about a um, very well-known Carterton personality, Helen Dew. Helen's been a, um, a greenie since before the dawn of time, and um, she's um, had this children's book written about her by two uh, wire rapper writers, Ellie Foster, who's done a lot of children's books, and Catherine Cooper, who uh, has written some adult fiction and non-fiction, really. Um, so we had a book launch uh, on the, I think, the 8th of August, and we sold enough books to actually get um, into the top 10 in the independent booksellers' book list. So uh, um, that was quite a good event for Wire Apple Word. Mm. Subsequent to that, we were involved with a celebration of National Poetry Day, which was originally going to rep involve 20 odd poets coming into the Arrow FM studios and we were going to have yeah, well we are going to have lunch but um, that became and some of us were looking forward to that <laughs> yes well it would have been a jolly little party I think but then it became illegal to do that uh, so we ran the thing on Zoom Michael pushed the buttons from, from Velda's seat and managed to get people in and out almost flawlessly um, slight exception was Velda's cousin, Pat White, who 
way down there and fairly didn't seem to have quite the bandwidth to um, make it seamless but he still until he got onto his wife Catherine's uh, computer (laughs) yes (laughs) and uh, generally things come right now my contribution on National Poetry Day was a handy little poem about how to remember the kings and queens of England and uh, I did have a reserve poem that Madeline Slavic in the end wouldn't let me read for probably good reason so (laughs) I've got a more captive audience now, so I'm going to read it now. Um, It's called The Car Who Jumped Over the Moon, written by a woman called Celia Johnson. In fact, it was Dame Celia Johnson, was a British actress, and she seemed to have written this to fit in with a house party given by Elizabeth the Queen Mother in 1982. And I think Elizabeth the Queen Mother was quite a riotous sort of woman, wasn't she? (laughs) I'm sure she had a lovely time. Um, So this is uh, a nod to the Olympics, which I thought it was appropriate, Mm. but it's also a sort of an um, ode to lost youth. Anyway, you'll get the sense of it. The Cow Who Jumped Over the Moon by Celia Johnson. The cow who jumped over the moon remarked, gazing up at the sky, I think I shall try those Olympics. There's no one as clever as I. If I went in for the high jump, I'd be sure of a medal, you see. Or was it grammatically better to say there's no one as clever as me? The head of the herd called Daisy, methodically chewing the cud, said, You haven't then jumped over the moon, my dear, since eons before the flood. And though it was slight, simply delightful, I must proffer a slight demur. What I'm trying to say is, you're not so young as you were. As far as I can remember, that dog was rather a flop. I'm all for some laughter and jollity, but he never knew when to stop. And the spoon with that dish were disgraceful. That caused the most fearful to do. There hasn't been quite such a rumpus since that woman who lived in that shoe. The cow who jumped over the moon replied, giving a tentative hop. There may be something in what you say. It's a long way over the top. I think I shall have to forego the fame and the dais with me in the middle. And the honour and glory, the flags and the cheers and the band playing. Hey, diddle, diddle. (laughs) The head of the herd, called Daisy, said with a satisfied glance, Your nobleness does you credit. One must give the heifers a chance. And thanks to your shining example, some of them aren't too dud. And after the selfless decision, they return to chewing the cud. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Steve. And, I mean, with a nod to the Olympics, which was really wonderful for lockdown you know the timing was brilliant it was and the and the the book well yeah this is a comes from an anthology called dancing by the light of the moon which is compiled by a guy called giles brandreth i'll read his little pedigree as well because that name's familiar yeah he's been on everything he's one of these english renaissance sort of people giles brandreth is a writer broadcaster actor former MP and government whip, now Chancellor of the University of Chester, and the founder of the Poetry Together Project that encourages young people and old people to learn poems by heart and share them over tea and cake. So there's about 250 poems in here, and they're all ones that he thinks people should memorise and be able to um, recite in the appropriate occasion. It's quite a skill. We, We all meet people now and then who, for some reason remember poems really well mm. and can recite them and, uh, and, t- and totally entertaining because of it it's a real and, uh, this is something I, I think it's a it's a it's a skill i think for from a, a, a past time where mm. there was a lot of recitation mm. a lot of memory mm. you know your, your homework in the days when we had homework was you know, remember this short poem and then practice reciting it and mm. learning it as a child, for some reason it stuck. And if you did a lot of that, you mm. ended up with this big mm. library of stuff. But today, not so. Do you, do you know John Ansell? No. Uh, John's a clever guy. He's a bit controversial. Worked in advertising. But we had a, years ago, we had a National Poetry Day thing in the old shop. And he came along and he recited this thing called, I think it was Spot of the antarctic and it was about a lengthy stanza after stanza of this thing about the fact that it wasn't amundsen who was first to the pole of course it was spot who was his lead dog <laughs> <laughs> and he marked the spot in um, oh, appropriate right. fashion with a yellow mark on the snow <laughs> 
<laughs> but John, he rattled that off from memory. Yeah, no, I, and, and we always admire them when we meet people like mm. that. That's, mm. it's, a clear, it's a great skill, yeah. Well, I, I can remember when I was working over in Melbourne, going to a, a camp right up on the Wiperfell Desert, or right up, up north of Victoria, northwest, and we were camping there, and they're all biology students, and one of the um, lecturers was a really interesting sort of erudite man, and he did population studies on kangaroos and cod and all sorts of fascinating things. But he read off by heart the, um, the uh, Victorian um, story about the... Um, the horse and um, you know down from the snow- oh the man from Snowy River oh okay yeah. oh, yeah, and, yep. and which goes on and on it was just wonderful mesmerising there was movement at the station yeah yes <laughs> the cult from old renown or something yeah. Yeah, no, you're onto it yep. yeah <laughs> so um, we because we didn't have um, TV on you before could we put Helen Jew's book up again please so people yes we can so can see uh, that. Good for you, Looks Helen like Jew. Yeah, Helen clutching the world in her arms. Um, which, is, yeah. which, which is what she does, really. Absolutely. But we, if we can stay there, please, for a minute. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yep. Right. Um, just get uh, staying with the wire up a word briefly. The, um, the September event, um, unfortunately couldn't proceed mm. um, but in October th- first um, event in October it will be uh, it's called the science and science fantasy featuring a woman called Octavia Cade who's a science educator uh, she's coming down from Cambridge um, but she's also a science fiction writer so she's going to talk about the reality of the science that makes up the stories that she writes about that'll be so. interesting I, yeah, it'll be a slightly different audience for us, mm. but we have great hopes. That's 3rd of October, isn't it? Yes, 3rd of October, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we're not sure about the venue. It'll either be in the li- in the courthouse. courthouse or we might have to move it across to the event centre, depending, because mm-hmm. we can't, under these rules, we can't get many people in the courthouse. Yep. Now, um, because this is called um, Book Lover's Corner, not necessarily books that Elmo's is trying to flog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the next book I want to talk about is one of my favourite books. I can't put it on the book rest because it's too bloody heavy. No, um, that's perfect as it is. Yep. Okay, so this is Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything, which I had I, in the illustrated gl- big glossy edition, which I brought at the Carton Rotary book sale at the beginning of August, which was oh. handy because... Gave me something to do <laughs> while we were stuck home for two weeks. Um, and I think, you know, every home should have one of these because if you want to know anything mm. about anything in in a sort of science and real world sort of way, then it'll be in here. And Bill Bryson has this marvellous way of oh. putting things that makes them understandable. He's I brilliant. D- I just thought, uh, for instance, Lord Kelvin, you know about Lord Kelvin? Yes. Kelvin's co- I didn't realise, but he also... Um, devised the principle or uh, made understandable the principle on which refrigerators work, which is where the name Calvinator mm. comes from. <laughs> okay. Didn't know that. Um, but he's also written about all sorts of people that I never heard of who were quite critical. And there's one guy who talks about uh, Carl Scheel, who was a Swedish... In fact, he was a, um, a pharmacist, really. Um, I'll just read this paragraph. Scheel was both an extraordinary and extraordinarily luckless fellow. A humble pharmacist with little in the way of advanced apparatus, he discovered eight elements. Tungsten, molybdenum, Mm. nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, fluorine, manganese and barium, and he got credit for none. In every case, his finds either were overlooked or made it into publication after someone else had made the same discovery independently. Um, Scheel's... (laughs) Pure Bryson... Shields' one notable shortcoming was a curious insistence on tasting a little of everything he worked with, oh. including such disagreeable substances as mercury and hydrocyanic acid, a compound so famously poisonous 
than 150 years later, Erwin Schrödinger chose it as his toxin of choice in a famous thought experience. In other words, that was going to kill, well, that was what was going to kill Schrödinger's cat. Scheele's rashness eventually caught up with him. In 1786, aged just 43, he was found dead at his workbench, surrounded by an array of toxic chemicals, any one of which could have accounted for the stunned and terminal look on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Dyer's well, got that sense of, oh. of the... I don't know, of, the absurd. The, the absurd and the, the, the telling tale that's sort of actually more fun than the, often than the, the man themselves, you mm. know. And, you know, and makes them very memorable. I love his stuff on um, space and time, and the, you know the speed the Earth moves and all that sort of stuff. I just it's it's fantastic book. Yeah, it is. And I, mean, I, I didn't even know there was an illustrated version. No, yeah. nor did I. And, no. um, well, I, I paid a bit over the I, odds for it. It cost me five dollars. I'm a bit envious. But, uh, but <laughs> yeah, no, I, I missed the sale this year. I was yeah. in Wellington. And it was on like two or three days, and yeah. I just uh, and I'm such a big fan of it and. Uh, Otherwise, I would have beat you to it, perhaps, possibly. You know. Oh, no, you wouldn't have, because you, were, you involved you in unpacking early. the books on the Friday. Oh. So that's, <laughs> there was no way I was going to get it then. No. Yeah. But that just is a good example yeah. of, of the bargains that we get on these, um, yeah. oh, these rotary book yeah. sales. Yeah. Um, how am I going for time? Yes, one, one more, okay. please. Well, this, was, this is good. That's yeah. all I was going to talk about. Um, Anne Cleves, uh, she... If you yes. Watch, the Vera series on the telly and the Shetland series. This is her brand new book called The Heron's Cry. Um, and it's not a Vera. It's set in North Devon. Mm. Uh, and this is the second of the Matthew Venns. Now, Anne Cleves has been Elmo's best-selling crime writer for years. Uh, and unless you count me child. And I don't really because those are more thrillers. Mm. Uh, but these are they're really character driven in the sense of the main police person you know Vera if you're familiar with Blenda mm. Bethard's interpretation she's quite mm. eccentric in a way but also very focused and she doesn't have the you know she's not an alcoholic she's not a wife beater she's not a, she hasn't got children that she's not Therefore, I mean, she just is quite a different sort of protagonist, really. Yeah. And Matthew Venn is as well. He's complete mm. antithesis of Vera, really. Mm. He's, he's extremely straight up and down sort of a character. Um, wears a suit under all circumstances. Uh, is considered a very good detective because he's so boring and unthreatening mm. that people tell him stuff because mm. they don't think he mm. represents any sort of a problem. Mm. Uh, and he's he runs the crime team in North Devon. So, but he's a uh, was a, a member of the Brethren. Lost his faith. Mm. Um, is uh, estranged from his parents. Father now dead, and is married to a man. So it's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he's not your standard detective. This is the Anne who like invented like Jimmy Perez and the Shetland. Yeah, yeah Jimmy Perez. Yeah, yeah. Which, I, I, which I saw. And I'm, I've mm. I've never read one. I've seen these things on TV. Yeah. Um, and they come across well then, but I'm, I'm so surprised to hear that it's the best selling. Yeah, well, we're crime writer. Partly because we've tended to recommend her to people, and because mm. she's quite prolific, mm. people will come back and buy them. Um, they're they're genuine whodunits in the sense that. Uh, the a bit like Ian Rankin, I suppose. Mm. So they're told from the point of view of the police, and when the crime is committed, the police don't know who did it, and they tend to go down mm. a whole lot of blind alleys and follow mm. red herrings, and that's kind of how these mm. are. You're never sure who was responsible mm. or what, mm. often, in fact, mm. what is really going on. Um, and this is like that. Mm. Um, and it's um, it's a very you good. You wonder how these people source their storylines, and you often think are they are they great buddies with police inspectors and you know homicide detectives and all that, and look at cases, and then suddenly you know that gives them a starting point. Do you they do. I know that um, Anne Cleves. I've listened to um, interviews, and I think they do go through old cases, hmm. and they do have mates in the force and different. 
to get ways. the technical yeah. stuff. Yeah. And and when you look at um, who they uh, owe thanks to, you know, they mention particular people in the force or in forensics or right. so they make sure they get the real oil, not not just something they've made up themselves. Mm. Yeah, I guess it's just the idea of a particular sort of crime and then packaging it up in your in your style. Yeah. It's um no, I'm, 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 you would you would recommend this? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Totally. I mean, as and it is, it's a lot like the Vera's that you see. It's it, it's not till towards the end that you start to get a sense of what was actually behind all the events. Mm. So that makes them interesting, I think. And they're consistently good. Yeah. Yes. They, there's a good high standard. They don't. There's not too many duds. Yeah. And when I mm, saw no. this was coming out, I immediately went on to the library and ordered it. Mm. You know, it's right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, Anne Cleves' The Heron's Cry. Thank you. A lovely selection of books. Thanks, Steve, <laughs> as always. Um, I'm going to talk about my the books that have interested me in recent times. And um, we might as well stick down in uh, southwest um, England. And I want to talk about, unfortunately, I've got no books. They've all gone back to the library. But uh, Raynor Wynne in the Salt Pass was one that came to my attention and I really, really enjoyed it. You thought it was depressing. Wow. Well, it's, pre- it's a pretty gloomy start, isn't it? Well, it is a gloomy start <laughs> because here they are, you know, a very hard-working couple who've taken an old farm, broken-down farm in the middle of Wales have and you know have done it up and in the process you know learnt to be sort of farmers brought their kids up there have uh, worked really really hard and have invested significantly in this plot of land and this buildings and with a future together there and through a dud um, investment by the husband moth they lose all their money and their possessions, and their home, and their future. So it's good so far. And that's, <laughs> that's you know, I mean, how appalling. It, it really makes you think about where you put your invested, where you put yeah. your money in. And from there it gets worse, doesn't and it? And then it does get worse, <laughs> because he finds out he's got terminal, uh, terminal illness. My God, what do you do? And the story starts when they're under the stairwell, where they can't be seen by the people who are coming and wanting to take over the house. What do they call this? They call them the people that come in and... What, the bailiffs? Bailiffs. Yeah. The bailiffs were knocking at the door and they're under there. And uh, Rain or, or Ray uh, spots this um, guide to the southwest coastal pathway and remember somebody had said, thought it was had recommended it. And they said, that's what we're going to do. I mean, what an inspired vision when you, <laughs> you've got the bailiffs at the door, you're going to lose everything, and probably, you know, one of them lose their lives. Well, I mean, you might as well do that as anything. Mm. And so they, with little money, they go in and buy a um, tent, which is actually not, a, not what we would call... You know, when we go tramping, we make sure we've got a good tent and good sleeping bags and, and good clothes to, you know... Yeah, this is one of those sort of cloth uh, things w- that used to have a picture of a red yeah. Indian on it. Yeah. Well, exactly. Not, like, for, like, not for outdoor use. No. Well, which was, <laughs> which was in the ditch down past the deer farmer's place this week, having been blown down by, from, by the wind. <laughs> um, just really, really inadequate clothing and, and wherewithal. And in addition to that, um, they had no money for food, so they actually lived on noodles forever, which I can't imagine anything worse. But, you know, if you've got nothing else, you do. And it actually is the most, I found it very inspiring, because you, you start off with life is couldn't get worse. And they started off with, you know, nothing in the way of, really good physical wherewithal to travel with but um, and they were treated as 
um, as they went around, they were treated as, you know, sort of homeless, the homeless, because they looked with their stuff. They didn't look like backpackers, you know, mm. straight, you know. Didn't have one of those didn't have Nordic, Nordic <laughs> poles and a proper backpack. And so yeah. they didn't look like backpackers. And so they were treated as homeless, which must have been a galling thing. When you've actually owned your own home, I mean, I sort of, if I was in that situation, you know, how galling that is, how, how do you deal with that? And so they got used to that. They got used to being abused. But what they did find was that if you actually had your stack of tea bags, water didn't cost any, hot water didn't cost anything. So they could go into the cafe and ask for hot water and then discreetly put their tea bag in. So they learned all sorts of tricks of the trade along the way. I can but tell you that cafe owners do not like that. Oh, I'm sure they, <laughs> I'm sure they don't. But if you have no money, you don't have any pride either. <laughs> Uh, but what they did do was become at one with the natural world. And that I can understand. Mm. Um, and I was watching on a, an interview with her on YouTube before I came today. And it was um, obviously uh, something that was deeply meaningful to them, that the, actually all the... Uh, concrete physical accoutrements didn't matter any at all. That what was really this, they, the stuff of life was this, at one with nature. And they found out very early on too that the vital medicine for Moth, the husband who was, you know, dying of this terminal dis- disease, he'd, his, they'd left his crucial medication behind, didn't have any way of g- getting it. And so he stopped all his medication because he didn't have anything to replace it by. And he got better. <laughs> and he kept on getting better. And by the end of their walk, he was, in fact, really well. It was very, very interesting. And um, I just found it um, really, really well worthwhile reading. And judging from everybody's comments, other people have found it mm. um, inspirational. So... This, this is a, a British book that's found its way into the yeah into the world's mm, reading. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's done very well. well okay, so mm. it's who buys it? Just is it nature? Oh, <laughs> we seem there seem to be we do pretty well with non-fiction books about the natural world. Yeah. Peter Wallen was, you know, the secret life of trees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, H for Hawk, you know, yeah. Yeah. about gospel, you know, that. Hell of a God. Yeah. No, yeah. They're, they're, so there's, yeah. Okay. So that's the readership. Yeah. The, it is. Know, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. But also, you see, they were doing the Southwest Coastal Pathway, much of which I have walked. Mm. And so for me, it got, there was an extra meaning. And for a lot of people, there would be, you know, oh, I remember that bit. You know, and they got to, uh, was it Mellon Cove? And I can remember going for a swim there. And, you know, just all sorts of neat bits of uh, memory came back as I was reading it. So they've, she's since um, written another book, uh, The Wild Way, uh, which doesn't appear to have had the same positive readership in the same way. Well, it hasn't got that... <laughs> dreadful beginning you know because yeah. i think she's right set in iceland so obviously she made enough money off the book to yeah. get a couple of air tickets to iceland mm. so um and it's not quite that desperation that well i think it's the des- i mean that's got to grab anybody mm. really mm. i mean you imagine yourself in that situation so out of the southwest and away from the southwest england uh to um Southwest Scotland, and I think we've talked before, maybe not with this incarnation of Book mm. Lovers Corner, but Sean Blaisels, um, who runs a book down in Wigtown in Southwest Scotland, mm. very inaccessible place. Because when I was in Scotland, I wanted to go there, but there's no way you can get there by public transport. That's an Irish joke, isn't it? Well, <laughs> you, you can't get there from here. <laughs> Well, there's very little space between Wigtown, I would imagine, and Ireland. I think yeah. they'd be very close there. And he's uh, written um, what the, the Confessions of a Bookseller and so on. He's, this is his third book. 
are seven kinds of people you find in a bookshop. And they're all the sorts, you know, you've got the people who come in and they know what they want, absolutely know what they want, and it's got a pink cover. And I, I should imagine you've come across that, Steve. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I've got, the bookseller's got two friends. One of is, is the Nielsen Book Find, mm. which if you know exactly what you want, will tell you exactly where to get it from and if it's still available and in what guise. The other is Google, mm. when you can ask Google almost anything and it'll come up with two or three options and you can run these by the person who's standing over the other side of the counter saying it was a pink book, had a haystack on page three with a needle in it um, <laughs> and I think the author probably was a man and, <laughs> and you can ask Google that and it'll come up with three or four options and people would say, oh yeah, it's that one. <laughs> So that actually does happen. All the time. And then you've got um, the parents who came in, come in and want sort of free um, childcare and who go off to do their shopping while the bookshop. But you probably don't. It has not been known to happen. No. Sometimes, I mean, people come into the cafe, which oh, is right. adjacent, and sometimes their kids get a bit bored sitting around my dad, so they'll come and sit in the corner of... And, of our little kids section and but I've got no problem with that mm. um, I don't see that as us being used as a babysitter I just see that as oh, yes. making I, kids comfortable with books and bookshops well, I think and, and I'd agree with that yeah. that's I think a different situation really isn't it yeah when we opened the shop the first time we bought two little ladybird chairs they're just sort of folding mm. red things got them from the warehouse at five dollars each or something I could have sold those a hundred times because kids just love sitting in it. Yeah. <laughs> so they're still there looking a bit ragged. Now, um, and other ones he talks about are the people who come in and know everything on a topic and want to inform you about how much knowledge they want, not necessarily that they want a book. Mm. That sounds like a Brit thing. Yeah. Us Kiwis, we don't do that stuff. Yeah. Do no, I don't think we do. No, I don't no. think we do either. Mm. I, mean, we've got, I have people who come chat to me at length about certain topics that we're mm. both interested in but they're mm. not trying to demonstrate their no. knowledge it's just, mm. so yeah no I don't yeah. see that <laughs> <laughs> <Scottish. laughs> so, so it, I found it fascinating yeah. to read through and, and think of it in terms of my own experiences of bookshops and so on um, so that was I found and that's so it's and he writes very easily um, and so again I watched an interview with him on YouTube before I came today and He's a very relaxed sort of guy. I mean, he's been in the business for 20 years. And one of the questions was, you know, what's he learnt? And one of the things is that he no longer does any online selling because he hates Amazon. Yeah, well, we all kind of hate Jeff Bezos, especially hmm. after he thanked the people working for him for oh. working for a dollar ninety an hour with no toilet breaks for him being allowed to fly off into outer space. I mean, they? that was Most so Most people wished blatant. he hadn't come back. Uh, I mean, I I think probably everybody who watched that clip <laughs> was just open mouthed that he had the gall yeah. to actually s say that. Credible. But he'd never met those people. No. 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 I mean, so. um, he wouldn't, and he wouldn't be interested in meeting them either. No. Uh, and so um, the last book I was going to talk about is The Woman Who Stole Vermeer by Anthony Amore. Uh, but I think what we might do is I might leave that till next time hmm. and um, we'll play some music now and then, Gareth, we can have a listen to what you have to say about your interesting books. Sure. So music is on.
Welcome back to Arrow FM 92.7 every fourth Tuesday of the month, uh, supported by Elmo's Bookshop of Carterton. Uh, As I said at the beginning, we get every month a Notes from the Far Isle from Sue, and the three books that she comments on in this for this past month was The Mother Wound by Amani Haider and it's an Australian writer who is a Muslim woman whose parents came from Lebanon to live in Sydney and she was born in Australia and is a lawyer and is a mother who also campaigns against domestic violence and the book tells of the story of events leading up to and following the death of her mother the wounding of her sister at the hands of their father. And it seems to me there's a lot of these stories about at the moment. Um, it's not the first one I've heard mm. with this sort of, uh, of this sort of genre. Uh, but uh, Sue um, found it to be um, uh, fascinating, detailed and a powerful advocacy against domestic violence. Another book was Yours Cheerfully by A.J. Pierce. A.J. Pierce wrote Dear Mrs. Bird in that's 2018. Yeah, and that's been a, a very successful piece of amusing, light, but well-written mm. fiction. And, um, and it picks up on the story of the characters from uh, Dear, Dear Mrs. Bird in this new book, Yours Cheerfully. And it's characters who work for Women's Friend magazine in London during the Second World War. Well, I can remember growing up with, you know, Women's Friend um, in my very young days and being fascinated by it because it presented a whole different life from what I was experienced growing up in New Zealand. And Sue says, I remember Dear Mrs. Bird book well and found this to be absolutely consistent in tone and character. I enjoyed the dialogue, which takes the reader back to a different era. 
I also enjoyed the fact that though the background is wartime Britain and women doing their bit for the war effort, the story is cheerful and positive overall and there's a real sense of people pulling together. Lessons for our times. Anyway, a nice, light and satisfying read. Good for a plane journey if ever you get to have one. (laughs) So um, absolutely uh, spot on for the times, I think, by the sound of it, Sue. Then the third one is Leanne Moriarty's latest one, Apples Never Fall. It's due for release in September and Sue's um, commenting on an advanced copy she got. Leanne Moriarty is a popular Australian author of fiction, um, including Big Little Lies, which was released as a TV series. Well, I can remember seeing um, Leanne Moriarty um, and talking about Big Little Lies when I was at the Melbourne Books Festival back in 2015, I think it was. I read it when I got back, and I had to say I just could not get into it. I did not relate to it at all. I felt... um, People do like them, though. But people obviously do. It wouldn't have become a TV Mm. series, and people do love it. So what, from your point of view, do you... Let's be honest here. I haven't read them. (laughs) But uh, she sells pretty well. Mm. Oh, I can believe that she would, but I I couldn't be bothered reading, you know, after I'd tried to read Big Little Lies Mm. and given up... um, and this is quite a, a rare critical. Well, we're normally quite optimistic and plug books that we kind of like. So it's, it's interesting to get a book that's getting the slight stab here. Well, that's know. me. Um, <laughs> no, and her. Well, and Sue says, Moriarty habitually overloads the reader with detail about characters rather than letting them reveal themselves, and the story lacks tension or excitement. Consequently, the book is overlong, and though I finished it, more or less... I was glad to get to the end. Well, I I actually applaud her for sticking with it. (laughs) (laughs) But I do acknowledge that it would be uh, it would appeal to a lot of people. Anyway, you should read her a little bit about her last book, which is when she talks about exit through the gift shop. uh, Right. Just a final note about exit through the gift shop by Marion Master which is a new story for young people dealing with the subject of death. And that's actually very pertinent at Mm. the moment, as kids perhaps see on TV, um, particularly when India, there was a lot of deaths from COVID. Mm. Um, Death would have come into everyday conversations, I would imagine. And uh, Sue gave this book to her granddaughter, who's nine, to read. And she was, was, what's her name? Lila. Lila. Uh, Layla. Yeah. Layla was so engrossed from the start and liked it a lot, but she didn't need to take up her grandmother's offers or opportunity to discuss or ask questions. <laughs> yeah. you, you know the book? Um, I don't. Um, okay. But um, sounds like it's a, it's a goodie. Mm. Mm. So that's um, Sue's notes from a far aisle for and, and we, this our, month. Our, our thoughts go out to her if she's watching. And we Still our stuck thoughts in level four for we the, do the world record. And hope she's got hope plenty she, of books. Well, <laughs> that's the thing, Sue. We hope you have plenty of books because you were actually were starting to go through books in your bookcase. So mm. maybe you're back to books in your bookcase. So we'll look forward to hearing um, for a, in two weeks' time to see how you su- how you're surviving. <laughs> you might uh, hopefully not in lockdown four by then. Hopefully even down to lock, lock, um, level three with a bit of luck. I think there was a promise made There's yesterday. Pro- wasn't yes, there? there was. The political promise mm. hard to break. Mm. So, um, Gareth, your your books for this. Right, I'm going to rattle through a, a range of books um, very quickly. First one, I have, I've actually now read Shuggy Bane, um, <sighs> which our book group was doing. and um, You got and to the end? No, yeah, I definitely got to the end. And we did it, it was during lockdown, so it was a Zoom book club meeting. And um, great reactions. We had some, a couple of people said this was probably one of the best books that our book club had ever engaged with. So, you know, right at the other mm. end. And at, at the other end, we had people who 
um, w- could barely read it and barely begin to start with it. Mm. Um, in fact, didn't want to engage with it at all. And all the rest of us sort of in the middle of it. So that's not because of the way it's written. That's because it's a tough story. It's a, it's a, right. the, the subject that matter would, is that's, that would have yeah. been my reaction. Mm. But in the end, I, I I came down on the side of the writing, and I thought it was mm. terrifically written. And and though it was despairing, it actually you you go well. Actually, this is 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 so um, sort of well expressed and in a way it's kind of like a memoir you got the feeling that was this guy had really opened up to us about some some big issues and um so you know i'm just giving it a it's saying it's it's a tough read but it, it didn't win the book for no reason no. this book mm. has found an audience yeah. and um and you know there are enough people who really love it um next one i alone can fix it a um the latest trump book um And there are many, many books about Trump um, and and his presidency. And this is called The Catastrophic Final Year. And it's written by Carol Leong and Philip Rucker, two Washington Post um, writers. And it'll take you back a little thing, you know, to, um, uh, you know, the Washington Post guys, all the president's men. You know, it's it's Mm. kind of, uh, it's got a bit of that. But I, I haven't read it. Steve hasn't read it. But my wife, Gail, has... And she's a real fan of books and watching the the the, the sort of side of Trump that um, I think fascinates the world in, in, in many dark ways. And it's a great book for actually showing how the media in New Zealand gives us one little snapshot, um, but the real story of the the chaos in the White House um, is another story, which we're not really party to, but. A book like this just gives up the detail and the stories, where the bodies are buried. It's absolutely, she said it in engrossing. And her take was, you know, this is a significant historical book. Um, and there are a lot written for various reasons by people with access to grind and with other agendas. Um, but this is kind of a reasonably apolitical enough um, to stand on its feet. Well, highly thought of. Um, and Trump, Trump, my recollection is that Trump was sufficiently um, keen to get his point across that he invited them down to Mar-a-Lago and they spent some hours, stayed for dinner, chatted to him and then did what they were going to do anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that reflects too, I mean, through apparently, is that there's, this is a many-sided chameleon-type person who can present a lot of different... Um, angles. Mm. Another one was a, got caught in the lockdown and so I had to go into the bookcase of my neighbours who I had to put out the SOS call and they came up with Orphan X um, by Greg Horowitz which I think was a, written in 2016. Somehow it got by me and it's kind of the super cool assassin type book uh, but who's kind of left the, the dark side is now doing good deeds and I'm looking in the catalogue there's now several more of these i think it was such a hit throughout the world that um he just hit the the replay button and we, there are more tales any idea what the next books are like i think the next one was called nowhere man and then i don't know where did it go from that i can't remember the titles but they, they've, they've sold, all they've all done reasonably well that one was the most successful which okay. sometimes isn't always the way with the first novel you mm. know things sometimes build up but I don't know, maybe they're a little repetitive, I'm not sure. But yeah. it's interesting when I just see from the front the comments, there's Lee Child, David Baldacci. Yep. Um, they're, they're just going outstanding Tessier. everywhere. Mm. It was obviously mm. just, it's hard to make, a, make get something fresh and new, and I think when it came out, it was fresh and new. Mm. Just watched on TV, you know, like John Wick Part 2 or something or other, very much of this genre, of the urban, super cool always ahead of the play um, sort of heroes and very very the, the body count is ex, you know excessive but entertain me during um, which is what it was meant to do uh, so you're reading books about killing people and I'm reading stuff about the the, the, the good stuff yeah and um, I don't know what that says <laughs> that, that's, well no it's lockdown it's the lockdown thing where we suddenly we want to be entertained a little bit more um, little thing from the economist um, which was an article on the recession, the attention recession, about how it's affecting us. Um, what you know, the amount of TV we're, we're watching. It started off. The first paragraph was about Levi Strauss um, in America saying that um, 
the, from the from the from he says a quarter of their customers no longer fit their pants size. <laughs> and, you know, he just says that in America that's been the issue, that people have sat down and they've eaten while they've watched TV. But, the economist goes on to go, books of, uh, of the printed variety also got a boost. In Britain, four out of ten people reported that they were reading more than they, they used to, according to Nielsen data. Uh, the jump was most pronounced among young people, and particularly women, who spent... 50% of more time reading than they did before the pandemic. Mm. Um, I think it's been a real factor in the growth of book sales. Mm. That yeah. people, people got the habit again because mm. it's an easy habit to get out of yeah. reading. Yeah. You know, mm. so many, it's easier just flick a switch on the tally and kind of doze. Picking up a book and making the effort uh, is a habit that people can get out of and a lot of people have got back into it. It's yeah. been very good. Um, much of the reading, uh, some of it was for escapism, mm. but it said much of the reading um, had a practical um, motive. Cooking and gardening books were the top choices in non-fiction, while in children books, um, home learning saw the biggest increase. Mm. Um, so this is the lockdown thing. Uh, the next book, um, how are we going for time? Yep. Okay. There's a graphic novel, uh, Revolver, which um, brand new book, um, and... I thought terrific. Matt Kint, K I D K I N K I N D T, um, has written it. It's a nice. Well, why it's fun is because it's about a pandemic of you know, mm. and um, in an American setting in Seattle, and it's just got out of hand, and the the whole country infrastructure is failing. But this guy is living two lives. So on on his. Well, the one day goes through, he is living, working in a big company, um, doing the celebrity photo editing and cropping with a, a boss. She's really hard on him and the girlfriend, and it's all pretty down. He's a bit of a slacker and all that. But the next day he lives the day, the same day again in the pandemic. So there's this parallel things, and he's learning things about what's going on, and the revolver is a, a sort of news sheet that this company in the parallel world is thinking of getting out. And you have these two great tales that are linked in the characters, but the, you know, and it's, it's a graphic novel at its best. It's because it's, it's, it's you can see it in a way, um, and it's different colors, like it goes blue and, and, and sort of sepia for the different um, take on it, on what days you're in. Um, and I thought totally engrossing and totally engaging. Tell me though, is these books in a bookshop? You... There's definitely a, a market. Are we, I'm starting to stock more graphic novels because, particularly, teenage boys, I suppose, like them, and they come in and say, "Can I have a look at your graphic novels?" And we're saying, "Well, no, because we haven't got any." So I don't want to keep on saying those to no. people, um, especially if there's a quid in it. Mm. Um, so we're we're carrying more that. Uh, I guess I've always, I've never been quite sure where graphic novels start and comics stop. Mm. Uh, Good question. And there's kind of a crossover point, and some of them look like comics, but they've got very mm. adult themes. A lot of them are very expensive. I mean, you can be spending $60, $70. Yeah. Uh, most mm. of them are less, but that, they'll be mm. up to that. Yeah. Um, our, our libraries have a reasonable holding. But they did have a charge on them back in the day, mm. I think, to help cover the, that expensive thing. I remember seeing a bookshop in Vancouver, totally graphic novels. Mm. And that was my thinking, because uh, there was nothing back here at home about, of that scale. Um, so it's a, there's a huge market for this. And my interest is, of course, from a, I like coming at it from an art angle. Mm. How good are, are mm. they at visualising it and drawing it up? Mm. Um, but I like the text too, so it's that nice match. Um, but I'm interested. I'm glad to see a that Elmo's is, is coming into the 21st century. And <laughs> <laughs> well, we're sort of inching towards the end of the 20th. Let's let's okay. not get carried away here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, it's um, Revolver. It's it's um, it's certainly a, a really good new release. Um, and so that's me. Fantastic. Thank you, Gareth. And I think we've got time now to go through what we've been talking about today. Um, Steve. So 
very briefly, um, with a nod to National Poetry Day, I read a, a, an inspiring piece of doggerel from this, um, I think, well worth having anthology, Dancing by the Light of the Moon by Giles Brendrith, poem about uh, jumping over the moon. Um, and if books you should have in your house, one's a good anthology of poetry and the other is my second-hand copy of Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything in the illustrated version. I think every home should have one. And, uh, and more current stuff, Anne Cleave's The Heron's Cry, which is the second of the Matthew Venn novels. And? Oh, and um, Helen Dew's or book about Good For You, Helen Dew by Ellie Foster and Catherine Cooper, local publication. Thank you. And Gareth? Okay, we looked at... Um, I Alone Can Fix It, a book about Donald Trump, um, a graphic novel, Revolver, um, which is has a terrific pandemic theme to it. And we've got, um, go reaching back a bit to a book written several years ago of a, of a sort of um, orphan X by Greg Horowitz, um, which spawned a series of books. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to pick up a... The sports theme, we're going to look at, because we just had the Tour de France, um, Mark Cavendish and his book, My Life in the Fast Lane. And I uh, looked at Raynor Wins the Salt Path and Sean Blythel, Seven Kinds of People You Find in Bookshops. And in a couple of weeks' time for the September edition of Book Lovers Corner, I will look at Anthony Amore's The Woman Who Stole Vermeer. And Sue mentioned The Mother Wound by Amani Haydar, H-A-Y-D-A-R. Yours Cheerfully by A.J. Pierce. Apples Never Fall by Leanne Moriarty. And Exit Through the Gift, Gift Shop by Mariam Master. So that's us for today, I think. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Steve. Thank, Thank you, you, Gareth. Valerie. Thank you, Steve. And um, and it's good night from good night. <laughs> good, good night from all of us. Thank you.